Hi everyone, this is Mehul Mehta and welcome to my YouTube channel. So for today's podcast, we have Sheikh Ahmed Ola who is working in the model validation team. So it's quite interesting that uh, Sheikh and I met at Regions. So he was working for the validation team and I was working for the modeling team. So, so you know, modeling and validation team, you know, works quite, you know, they have, there's a lot, lot of back and forth that happens between the modeling team and the validation team. So in today's podcast, let's understand, uh, you know, the role of model validators and quant finance and, you know, each and everything, you know, what model validators do, what kind of knowledge is required. But before diving deep into all this, let's understand the education background and the working background of Sheikh. So Sheikh, uh, if you can walk us through your education and your working background. Uh, thank you, Mehul, for uh, describing a little bit of background between us. Uh, I, I still remember I was uh, validating one model like this. I guess this was a PPNR model, and I, I made the team. Uh, 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 the manager was Jianli Chen, maybe. Uh, yeah, right. So, so uh, I still remember the first day I, I saw Mehul, and then, and he was really great to talk to, and kind of uh, later a lot of uh, moments. So we, we kind of uh, inter interacted to each other. And uh, I'm glad that uh, Mehul is doing this because not a lot of stuff uh, about model validation is uh, uh, available around here. So I'll start a little bit of background with me. So uh, I, uh, I'm a little bit uh, different than uh, straight coming from uh, math, uh, financial mathematics to model validation or quant finance. So my undergraduate was uh, in mathematics and in my final year project, I did something like uh, uh, option pricing, uh, Black-Scholes model and using some sigma algebra or asset pricing models like binomial asset pricing models. So that created a little bit of interest in me. Uh, and since I was already doing an undergraduate in mathematics, I was thinking, okay, yeah, that, that may be a good, good way to move forward. And later I went to um, teaching uh, for a while and then uh, came in, uh, in US uh, in 2014 for a PhD in applied mathematics. Uh, I, and back then I had a, had a kind of uh, idea that like I'll move to financial mathematics at some point, but uh, uh, my PhD was actually focusing on a numerical analysis. So for, uh, for that part, um, I, I was happy with that because uh, it trained me uh, with uh, programming and uh, how kind of uh, uh, in numerical analysis uh, uh, research, you also design some some set of codes. You execute an algorithm and you test like how it's uh, working. Is it is it producing the right results? Is uh, how far it uh, um, uh, is it is it is it better than the existing ones? So uh, that test kind of helped me. Uh, those kind of uh, tests on numerical algorithms uh, later when I moved. So uh, after finishing my PhD. Uh, I was looking for a job in financial mathematics, and this uh, this ad with model validation came in in front, and and then kind of uh, I knew one or two people, and I talked with them, and it seemed like really interesting because uh, a few other mathematicians were working after finishing their PhDs with like uh, uh, PhD in physics, economics, and st statistics. So I talked with them, and one thing uh, uh, made me interested about this was like. Uh, in the model validation department, you're you're working with a wide variety of models. Like uh, the bank uses a different kind of models, like different departments of the bank, like uh, like the treasury department uh, designs some kind of model, and then uh, the loss forecasting group they they design some kind of model. So uh, also the fraud space is a little bit different. Uh, even the HR uh, uses some models. So uh, model validation uh, interacts with all those types of models. So this is a place uh, um, in the banking industry where you can see it and you can see a wide variety of models. And, it, and, and, the, and this is a great start uh, to me. It seems like it's a great start because I'll have a, a view of all the models and then I can decide like which area I can get to and, uh, and become an expert on that. So that's the kind of uh, my interest and background and education. So it's a uh, uh, undergrad math, master's in math and PhD in applied mathematics and then teaching in academia for a while and then and then moving to banking industry. Definitely. I mean, thank you for walking through your background. It's, I guess uh, your, I mean, your whole, you know, life revolved around, you know, working on mathematics and stuff. So it's, it's quite interesting to know about it. Uh, also, like, what do you think, Lynn, you know, what is, uh, I, because I really want to understand, like, what is the role of 
model velocity in quant finance like what do they do actually that is a good question i uh, actually it took me a, a while to actually figure out all all of this so um, i guess the uh, banks uses uh, a lot of models like other 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 areas of business and uh not uh, as everyone knows like models are not accurate right you can get a better model but they'll never be accurately predicting or calculating something so they need a validation process and this is started this uh, field uh as far as i know that it started in around 2011-10 when sr 11-7 came it's a it's a supervisory later from fed and it kind of required a certain uh, uh, banks over you know, size to have a model validation department which will be responsible to uh, uh, continuously monitor and validate the models banks are using uh, so uh, that kind of the start of this field and then it it flourished like in, in the last uh, uh, decade or more and uh, uh, as a, as a, as a main focus for this validation jobs are 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 making sure the models designed by the developer so in the banks you have different de uh, departments who are developing different type of models and after that they are sending it to model validation department where a team is uh, working on to check uh, six areas of a model uh, before uh, it goes to production uh, those six areas would be the first one would be conceptual framework uh the second would be focused on the data model data and input data and the third area is outcome analysis like uh, uh whatever the uh, output pr uh, produced by the model uh, analysis on that kind of kind of making sure that uh, it's it's a uh, fulfilling all the assumptions of the chosen theory so that is the third one and then uh, the fourth one is the implementation of a model like um, it, it's just not enough to just design a good model like how do you are using this uh, if the users are uh, using it properly as it was designed or they have a uh, full understanding of that so that uh, those areas uh, fall under that the fifth one is ongoing monitoring um, the, uh, this is this is a very uh, i was really happy to see this because in academia i have seen that like we, we built a lot of model we tested it our team uh, did work we sent we sent it to journals paper uh, and uh, to publish and it was peer reviewed maybe one or two, two other people checked it but the i mean like if you want to use any model regularly for in, in production to decide like important factors for for a bank you need an ongoing monitoring process because uh say when the model is designed and uh, and then like you are using it for one two three four year uh, uh, when time passes uh, things changes like the environment changes like uh, a lot of things changes like recently the interest rate was high uh, uh, high up so so you need a monitoring process uh, and 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 this area of the model validation, we kind of check if the if the model has a proper ongoing monitoring program with it, and what's the frequency and how they're doing and designing it. So, so that's the uh, fifth uh, fifth uh, uh, component of the model validation. The sixth one is checking the control and governance. So it's kind of making sure you have enough controls like at uh, different stages of the whole calculation or whole implementation, so that um uh, you can avoid the mistakes uh you, uh, you can you can make sure that like uh the codes uh, the data or, or the process however it was designed uh, and that is in production uh in a in, in a robust uh, in a way so that it doesn't get changed by someone's like um, uh, 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 being a little bit inactive or something so so you need a control and the governance like uh, maintaining uh, all the all the uh, all the uh, materials uh, um, related to model like the model documentation and if this gets any um, like if there is any significant change proposed sending those to model validation or other departments for approval so you need a governance program around it so these are the six areas like i'll i'll say it again conceptual framework data outcome analysis implementation ongoing monitoring and control and governance so so wow, these are the yeah. six areas we try to look at no <laughs> that's amazing you know actually i guess i feel like i have read the sr117 framework and you know it like the way it's broken down i guess what you said if someone uh, you know understand your your part i mean more than enough so 
also like uh, i just want to understand like when you because you deal with a lot of quantitative models so like how do you approach the validation of uh, of any you know of any quantitative model or any financial model yeah that's that's another good question yes so uh, uh so there are different type of model uh, validation activities like with a different rigor or depth you go so normally uh, a full scope validation we call it that means like it checks every all those six areas in depth. So uh, I what I start with is like I, I try to understand the model at first, and and that starts with reading the model documentation. Um, given that like oh there is a proof of documentation, sometimes you don't have it, but model documentation is the start. So you try to understand all uh, every part of it, and then you uh, you read the previous validation reports. It's like if it's like in production for a few years, you will have previous validation reports where like previous people checked and tested different areas and you have to understand like uh, how, uh, like which things are designed for which reason. Also, you try to create a timeline. Like sometimes some models are in production say five years, like, and you will see that like uh, after two or three years, uh, the things you're looking at, it's uh, completely different than the initial it was proposed because the changes happened. And, and so you kind of try to figure out when it happened, how it happened. So uh, the main idea is like you, you, you make a, very good understanding of the model and every component of it. And that requires like running the codes uh, support, uh, submitted to you and you, you replicate in different stages uh, of the um, uh, uh, model codes. And, and the next step is kind of like meeting the owner of the model, the developers, uh, like when you do, like try to understand through those previous steps, you will have a lot of questions. So what we do is like, you have a talk with the model owner, developer, and, and you try to, uh, get uh, answer to your questions also. Also, you have some other questions just for your test, like, oh, there's a proper control or not. I see there's this control. Are you actually maintaining this or not? So kind of like a kind of a lot of meeting with my owner and developers. And then you decide which test are you going to do. Like you, you based on whatever have done before and and uh, you design, you, you choose some tests because we, we don't get a lot of time uh, like model developers to spend the time uh, uh, to spend time with the more uh, actual model model developers get a lot of time to spend so they, they definitely understand the, uh, a lot better than us but we have to at that point decide some test which will be uh, uh, necessary to check all the six eight as i mentioned and you do those tests and the last part i was talking about then, then you write the report writing is a is a huge part of our job well, so uh, explaining all those things, summarizing and kind of uh, putting uh, it in a presentable format uh, so that uh, it's, it's a concise and brief and, and it's touching all the important parts uh, is kind of a skill necessary for this. Uh, so that's the last part. So you write the report, you write, the, you write, you communicate your findings. If you find something, uh, some issues there, you communicate those with model owners, developers, and and, and put it into a report. So that's that's the end of the um, uh, of a validation project, starting from the model documentation, ending into the validation report. So also, like, what all uh, knowledge is important for validation? Like, because you know, some people say, hey, you should know derivative pricing. Some people say you should know Monte Carlo simulation. Some people say, you know, hey, if you are good with regression analysis and machine learning methods, you are good for these roles. Like, if you can talk, if you can tell us, like, what kind of, uh, I mean, what kind of knowledge is required for, for you know, being a model validator and any important subjects that, you know, let's say a graduate student uh, should look into or an undergraduate should, student should look into? Yeah, that is another good question, I would say, because... Uh, uh, I would give you an idea like how model validation department works. So a medium-sized bank will have a large enough department to focus on different areas of model. Uh, like you, they will have multiple teams focusing on different areas of model. Like say they'll have a team focusing on fraud areas. They will have a team focusing on treasury models. They will have a team focusing on BSA ML models. They, they'll and another team like uh, focusing on the stress testing CRC soul models. So they will have different teams working, uh, focusing on those areas. Uh, but, uh, and uh, the, the exact um, skills required for those teams might change a little bit, 
but uh, I, I'll go through a kind of collection of uh, topics as a subjects um, uh, can be helpful uh, if you later start working on as, as a validation uh, analyst. So definitely a lot of statistics, probability theory, uh, different distributions, uh, and then econometrics, if you go for seeker CSO models, just as in loss forecasting type of things, and definitely regression, uh, time series, survival analysis. Uh, so uh, besides those, you definitely have some programming, uh, have to have programming skills, because even though you're not a model developer, but you need to understand what the code model developer produced, and you, you need to check those, you need to rerun those, you need to, uh, you need to find, you have to be able to identify if there is any problem in that code. So, so it's kind of the same level of uh, programming skills that the model, uh, model developers uh, uh, need. Uh, idea about risk management, different type of risk, credit risk, uh, different you know, credit risk, market risk, um, uh, regulatory risk, uh, uh, all these kinds like uh, um, uh, people sometimes goes for FRM, FRM exams on, on those kinds of certifications. So uh, knowledge on risk management. And then if you kind of, uh, there's one department, uh, one team might be working on say uh, financial models like derivative pricing, asset pricing, Monte Carlo simulation. So uh, those those things also necessary. And I think um, uh, you know people coming from financial mathematics like get those trainings, right? So like the masters in mathematics, yeah. Right, right. So actually, yes. in, in 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 like masters in financial math or financial engineering or computational finance. What you just mentioned are like the core subjects that we have to take, like derivative yes. pricing, Monte Carlo simulation, stochastic calculus, risk management, yes. fixed income. Yes. Um, so these, yes. you know, these remains like the, and like of course data science, machine learning, so time econometric yes. modeling. So these remain yes. the key, the key, the key core. But you know, there are times when there are a lot of students, you know, who can't pursue the masters, you know, in uh, in United States. But still, you know, mm -hmm. they have an undergraduate degree in math and, or let's say, undergraduate degree in data science and machine learning. And that's where mm -hmm. you know they, they should also understand. Yeah, I mean, because uh, because I feel like it it depends a lot on the kind of role you are targeting. Because one of my friend, so he's uh, basically a model validator at Intercontinental Exchange. It's basically so his role is more towards derivative pricing. So in his day to day activity, he's a model validator for but but for derivative pricing. You know, derivative his yeah, his area yeah. is derivative pricing. So he says like he has to use a lot of stochastic calculus, uh, Monte Carlo, mm -hmm. Python, and yes. of course like uh, the, all this you know the core concepts of derivatives in his like day to day lang uh, day to day workplace. So I, I feel it's yeah. more it's very much inclined to what kind of uh, you know what kind of risk I guess because in the model validation also there are different teams. Uh, please correct mm -hmm. me if I'm wrong. That's what I got no, to no, know. Sure, yeah. Yeah, that there are different teams and each team focuses on some some segment of in the banking world or in the, let's say in the yeah. other other worlds, yeah. Yes, exactly, yes, yes, that, that yeah, uh, that uh, exactly um, right. Uh, I was mentioning, I'm uh, going to mention the stochastic calculus. Uh, so uh, when you look at uh, the main area, one of the main areas like the, uh, price, uh, like pricing, uh, it can be derivative asset pricing, and in those areas you need that you need a stochastic calculus. But if you go for say seeker CSL models, maybe you might not need that. So it depends. But uh, having trained on all of this, you might not uh, you you don't know like uh, which team you're going to join and what they are going to need, or maybe the need might change over time. So exposure to all these areas is beneficial, and it's going to uh, work for you for the interview, right? So uh, even though the, maybe they're now thinking about where, whatever the hiring committee is, uh, say uh, a, a job and in, 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 uh, derivative pricing, but maybe they also have some other teams working on say um, uh, econometric model. So, uh, so having exposure to all of these areas, definitely machine learning, deep learning and AI. Uh, still, I would say maybe, uh, maybe uh, Mehul can add on that. I, I, I would say the use of ML and AI models is not that much uh, still. It's 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 growing, uh, but it's not the uh, if we see all the whole collection of models, 
uh, not many models are using uh, ML and AI right. yet. Right. I, I believe one of the main reasons is because regulators uh, yeah. still assume these as like black box models and, you know, it's more on, you know, inter uh, understanding what's going in the in the model. So let's say if you take any other any model, um, no one, I mean, we can definitely, you know, we can say, oh, this is happening, that is happening, but no one can specifically point like, oh, this is yeah. how it's it's working. Or let's say these are the coefficient, let's say linear regression, it gives pretty much the coefficient for all the variables. But for if, if you take any random forest model, it can give you the ranking yeah. of it. I mean, which features are important, but yes. not the coefficient. So I, I still feel uh, this can be like one of the core reason why regulator feel um, <laughs> discomfort. And of course, like we like, medium to big size bank have like billion dollar portfolio so so yeah you cannot risk yes. that part here yes yes exactly like the explainability of uh, uh machine learning and air models is kind of a big issue and then uh, banking is is a highly regulated industry um uh, not uh, unlike software industry uh, software industry has regulations but we have more Regular, uh, regulator, uh, as, uh, 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 control uh, and regulations on on us. So, so that's 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 not one reason. But uh, looking forward, it's going to increase definitely um, the use of this uh, this 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 type of things. Uh, the last thing I was going to mention that writing, right? So in in the previous part also I mentioned that like the writing is a huge part. Being able to simplify complex ideas. And, and summarize and then being able to figure out what to put in your report, uh, what not, what is important, what is not, and then uh, uh, putting them together as a story. Uh, that's a, a skill necessary for this job, uh, besides all those technical sides. Right. Also, uh, Sheikh, like, what are some common statistical tests that you, you, because I totally understand it depends on like the team you are in. But for mm -hmm. like in your team, like what are you, like some of the statistical common statistical tests that uh, you know you use on day to day basis? Like if you can name a few of them. Yeah, sure. Uh, I mainly work on uh, stress testing models, uh, loss forecasting exactly. Uh, but again, it it might differ. Uh, it, it might depend on what areas of model you're working on. Uh, someone working on fin uh, fraud risk models uh, might be different. Someone working on maybe uh, financial modeling, so, uh, uh, pricing models may be different. So I'll, I'll go with, uh, say, uh, just uh, uh, simple regressions things. Like uh, if you have a ordinary linear regressions, definitely you, you check for the assumptions. Or I'll, I'll start that with the assumptions. Like it doesn't matter what you are using the linear regression, non-linear machine learning, or, or, or say uh, any Black-Scholes model or, or whatever, you need to have an understanding of what are the assumptions for that method and if that is satisfied for the problems you're trying to solve. So the assumptions need to be satisfied. So the, we, we, we do run those tests uh, that if whatever the assumption was proposed in the in the say the paper or whatever published for this methodology, we check that and see if the assumptions are met for the use of that uh, method in in this problem. So that's that's one thing. And for OLS, uh, yeah, we are going to have specification tests like Link or Ramsey uh, test. Uh, multi collinearity is one of the areas you are going to look at. You are going to look at the VIF numbers. Uh, you're going to definitely consider the significance of variables using p-values and kind of a right to so for that. You're going to look for stationarity um, if you want to use ARIMA methods. Uh, and among stationarity tests, like you can use maybe K KPSS, ADF tests. Uh, sometimes you, you want to see if there is a structural break. You might want to use CHO test. It's kind of a F distribution test. And then... Uh, most of the, uh, we always do this, like the goodness of fit test, like chi square test, case test, has more name show, if, I, if I'm remembering correctly, yeah. Uh, so that test, uh, besides those things, uh, you, you might wanna do back test, which is kind of common to everything, like even the machine learning, you want to do back test, you want to see, you want to do in time and out of time back test and see uh, how it's predicting um, uh, back in time after train, so uh, that's one thing. We, we definitely like to see benchmarking tests, like you you don't just do develop one model, you you you, you consider uh, two or three uh, 
several benchmark, benchmarking models. You, you compare the results produced by your chosen model with the benchmarking models, and you see, uh, you try to see, test how di uh, different they are. For classification problems, you might want to check the ROC curve, AUC uh, test. So th th these are the things I can remember now, uh, but it's not uh, including all of this. There are many other tests. Uh, yeah, just to uh, test the same things I have mentioned. Yeah, definitely. I guess you did mention a lot of tests. I guess, I guess both both on the linear regression side on and on the time series side. Uh, so definitely, I guess someone with a good amount of who has like a good understanding of statistics might be able to perform all this test really nice. Um, so yeah, I mean, also like, can you discuss like what are the challenges like what you face in your uh, like while validating any quant models uh, in general, like. Yeah, uh, definitely. Uh, like every other job, we have challenges. Uh, a major challenge to me at, at, at least thing like uh, we have short period to do the validation of a model, right? So we have like few months at most like uh, to look at a very complex model, which took like uh, more than two, three years, maybe, maybe two years, maybe like something like that to develop. Uh, so you need to understand everything uh, about that model, do all those tests. Uh, figure out if there is any problem, write everything in the in the report. So sometimes I feel I get short time, uh, which is good and bad. So uh, you have to kind of like, another challenge is managing your time and effort to uh, uh, maintain the quality of your validation also meet the deadlines, right? So at some point you have to make a decision, oh, I'm gonna do this, this, this test and I'm not gonna do this test based on the risk is uh, related to that model uh, based on like if that test was done before or not, you make a judgment like if the previous test is, is still valid or not. So those kind of things. So uh, making a decision at those points might sometimes get gets trickier and uh, one, uh, I see it, it is a uh, advantage. Also, it might be a problem that like you have to deal, deal with a wide variety of problems. Like, so say after after a year or two, you're being comfortable with like some of the models, uh, but then uh, suddenly now you have to look at a different model, which is a different kind of, like completely different methodology. And you need to understand all the terms, uh, all, the, all the, everything around that. So, so I, I like that part, uh, continuous learning. You have to kind of pick up new things very quickly. Uh, also, sometimes uh, you you just wish that like oh I I I, I just want just to be uh, maybe comfortable with that anyway. So that's that's one thing. And the last thing I would say that is like communication. Uh, mm, a lot of time you have to communicate the findings or issues you're finding. Uh, yeah, you're uh, you have found in the model with the model owner and model developer, and you have to tell them that like oh and how do you communicate that. Uh, uh, are you communicating that from a place of curiosity or, or, or how you're dealing with that? that that's a tricky part to me. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, like, uh, how does, what do you think? How has machine learning impacted the field of model validation? Like, how do you, like, if you can walk us through that? Uh, well, yeah, let's go there. Uh, uh, as I mentioned before, and you also uh, touched this part, like, uh, there's not many models we have now in banking or, uh, which uses machine learning, but we see there, there is definitely the uh, uh, banks are using machine learning and uh, AI's, AI models. Uh, so uh, I guess uh, this question of explainability came when the machine learning was introduced. So that's kind of a uh, impacted in the model validation we didn't think about before. Um, also. Uh, performance matrices are different for machine learning a little bit, but I mean, from regression, you can take a lot of things there, but there might be some other other uh, metrics you will need to learn. Uh, so, so yeah, uh, I, I guess those are the uh, ideas are affected in model validation. Uh, like those are the major areas. Uh, definitely, we need to uh, have a training on machine learning and then have an understanding of those models uh, right. because they 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 they're growing and and we need we we need to skill build up skills on validating those. I guess it is a continuous development of you know you learning different uh, technologies because things yes. are progressing so fast in all the yes. worlds. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah.
definitely also like, yeah also like what are some common pitfalls and like financial model like when you when, when you know when, which can like if, if if to just to frame it properly like you know what are come so let's say what are common pitfalls and financial model development that validation can prevent uh yeah so uh it's always the good to uh, good good to have your models checked by someone else uh, okay. it's not model even if you write something you, uh, if you get someone to check it it's fine but i, I guess the areas is like uh, a lot of time we have, uh, we have some expert people in model validation team who can uh, who can uh, uh, point out to some areas where maybe model developer have missed uh, right. to look at uh, uh, and having a model validation department uh, just the existence of it makes sure that like model developers are being careful about uh, designing it properly and uh, having the correct documentation maintaining all the regulations uh, uh, so having a kind of comparable experts working and checking like it's kind of a peer review i would say um, uh, from academia like when you uh, uh, submit a journal publication publication uh, the same area experts kind of look at your work right so so i think model validation kind of uh, plays that role uh, and that's a very important uh, because uh, mistakes from models are not 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 uh, i would say uh, not un unimportant. It's very important. Like it, it can affect major areas, and then it can have uh, huge impacts on on banks' performance and everything. Right, right. Definitely, I feel uh, validating the work. It's very important because, of course, like someone like if I'm building the model, it has happened so many times. You know, when I have built the model, and you know, I see oh, it's it's like the perfect model, and you know, so yeah. my colleague who is like helping me in the model, he says, you know, oh, there's something wrong with the model, you know, there's something off and uh, having that second eye on, you know, the model is like very important. Also, like, how, what do you think, how does like regulation uh, influence the model validation process? Because I know like first, you know, we had SI 117, then we had SI 1518, 1519. So like, what do you think, like the regulation, like uh, all this regulation, how do they impact your uh, validation processes? Uh, the influence of regulation and model validation process is huge. We have to be aware of the changing regulatory environment. We have to be kind of like keeping track of all the all the changes. And uh, while we are doing the validation, we have to keep an eye uh, if it's validating any 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 of the rules. Say say uh, we have a section called variable selection, and uh, when we, we we do the test in those areas. There are uh, regulations that like you cannot choose certain type of variables in your model. Like when you're using house pricing, you cannot use race, gender kind of indicator variables there. Uh, so those kind of things. Uh, so model validators definitely have to have very good understanding of the, all the all the regulations around it. And uh, uh, as we talk about SR 11.7, I mean, we exist for those regula regulatory letters, yeah. uh, the whole department, right? So, and there are more, uh, updated versions of those coming out, addressing new new issues. Um, it's, it's still a new field, uh, just, uh, just been over like uh, 12, 13 years, uh, it's running, so. Um, I guess in in front like there will be new regulations and 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 kind of like solving a lot of like uh, untouched or unexplained areas before as a uh, as a matter of validations work. So uh, uh, I would say that 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 has a huge influence regulations on my model validation process. Okay, and like uh, uh, so like um, what steps do you take? Uh, to make sure like the model is robust. I, I understand the ongoing monitoring. So is it yeah. like, so if let's say the model has been developed and is in production, ongoing yeah. monitoring, is it the only thing that you see or is there any other steps? Uh, yes, I will uh, say ongoing monitoring, but under that, there are a lot of things like uh, what are you doing under ongoing monitoring? That's that's a major issue. And are you doing modern monitoring uh, uh, regularly and like 
enough. Like for some models, maybe it doesn't need to be like uh, 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 every other month or something, right? So some models maybe once in a year is fine. Some other models you need to do maybe twice a year, something like that. Uh, besides that, under ongoing monitoring, I would say, are you including enough uh, the correct test under it to indicate the model performance? Because um, uh, if you don't have the correct test under it, if you just have something which doesn't change over time and which doesn't uh, 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 represent the model performance, actual model performance, then it's not gonna work. Just uh, having a model ongoing monitoring uh, is not gonna work. Also, what do you do? Like how do, how do you set up the thresholds for your test under the model, ongoing monitoring, right? Like say um, you have a, threshold which is too high, never your model performance, uh, your, your test for ongoing monitoring uh, program um, never produces any value near your threshold. So it never crosses the threshold. So nothing goes wrong with this. Like you see that like the model is always perfect and good, but actually it's not. So, so how do you design those uh, tests for your model, ongoing monitoring? That's one very important thing. Uh, the other thing is, do you have effective controls in place? Right. So, how you're managing your data each time uh, you're running the code, uh, or sorry, you're running the production process, how you're pulling it, uh, and how is it is it being saved? Uh, uh, who is processing? Is he is he following all the uh, correct steps as it was designed? Uh, and after he's processing, is there any check on that? Like, if someone is valid, like checking if the process was uh, followed correctly or not. Uh, so th this can be varied for different models. Um, I have seen models where um, two, in two analysts does the same processing independently and they compare results. Um, this, that's just an example. Uh, so different controls in place can make, the, uh, uh, make it less risky, avoid uh, mistakes. So uh, also, uh, in your ongoing monitoring program, do you have plans, action plans after um, uh, when, uh, say, when the model goes, um, performance goes down, uh, what do you do? What's your action plan? Like, uh, so a definite plan, uh, documented plan is very important because, well, uh, the model is performance is not good. Uh, so what are the next steps? Is it not like, you, do you need to redevelop it? Do you need to get a refeed? Like uh, you produce the coefficients again. Do you need to uh, like uh, consider the benchmark models? Look at those. So the, it can, it can uh, get into place differently, but yeah. So action plans uh, after uh, model deteriorations uh, having correct tests in the ongoing monitoring program, having effective controls. So those are the main areas I, I can I can remember now. Uh, 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 there might be some others, but those are the main areas I would say to make it robust. No, no, definitely what you said, right? I still remember I was working on a on a model, and uh, you know the difference. Like we were doing the on ongoing monitoring. Uh, and like the difference between the actual values and the predicted values for, was greater than 10%. And yeah. that's where we realized it's in red zone. And yeah. then we we did try to recalibrate the model that is basically to generate, regenerate the coefficients, yes. but that did not work either. So it was because uh, like the Fed was increasing the interest rates and yes. stuff like that. And like the, I guess the model broke down and then that's where we decided, okay, let's redevelop the whole model. So yes. yes. Yeah, I would add there that like we have a regular ongoing monitoring assessment things like uh, we do check regular in regular frequency if the models uh, we have in our, our inventory are doing their model, ongoing monitoring programs correctly or not. We have annual reviews to check those. So there are different checkpoints like we make sure uh, uh, there is correct ongoing monitoring program done. Sure, definitely. Sure, definitely, Sheikh. So I have this last question, which I wanted to ask. Do you have any advice um, for, uh, you know, model validators, aspirants, because there are a lot of people who want to enter into the model, quant, like the quant model validation department, or let's say the model validation team, like any advice for them, like how should they prepare or, you know, anything you want to suggest? Well, the first thing I would say that like, don't understand 
underestimate the power of linear regression, right? Uh, that is one thing I, uh, uh, I, I learned that like, you know, it is so simple, but it's so effective. And uh, anyway, so the, uh, jokes apart, uh, definitely try to uh, gain uh, more understanding of statistics, econometric courses uh, as, as, as much as possible. Uh, learn database management, SQL, uh, uh, some common programming languages for banking like SAS, uh, Python definitely, uh, and uh, well, the I think data engineering or like feature engineering, those kind of stuffs. Um, try to gain ex uh, experience on those, uh, and if you're serious, then try to get an internship uh, in some model validation department. That's the best thing uh, you can you can you can you can do because uh, that's gonna teach you uh, like what the model validators do, uh, even in just just being in the department. Uh, doesn't matter what you're doing there, but but being in the department, talking with other validators and analysts, what they're doing. Um, if you don't get internship, just find someone you know who is working in validation, uh, uh, model validation department and talk with them, uh, try to learn what do they do and then and, and, and how, how their day-to-day uh, uh, -day life is uh, in the workplace, uh, I, I guess, these, uh, this, this, these are the some things uh, which might help if someone is uh, targeting for model validation jobs, uh, but you can add some too, right? Definitely, I feel like uh, what you covered uh, is like a complete list and something on, I feel like uh, because in the interviews, they'll also uh, target on variety of stuff, like they'll target on machine learning, they'll target on derivative pricing, sometimes yes. they target on fixed income modeling, so yes. I feel like having knowledge. So I, I always feel you know model validation is is one such department where the learning never stops. It's always yes. like continuous learning because you have to work on so many different variety of models, be starting from credit risk models, market risk, derivative pricing, stuff like that. So I yeah. feel like uh, yeah, I mean having a basic knowledge, a good no amount of knowledge on statistics, regression modeling, time series mm -hmm. modeling. Uh, yeah. Of course, Python is like very important to understand because uh, that's where you, you know, ex I mean, you make sure what the development team or let's say the modeling team has developed, it's right. So, and then of course, like derivatives and fixed income market is, uh, I feel like to add on like these two, you know, few. Yeah, few, yeah, yeah. No, no, yeah, that, that definitely, uh, that is uh, that is very important though, uh, understanding those to topics. Uh, yeah. Uh, that's all I can remember now. Uh, uh, it's really great to talk about this. Uh, 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 I still feel that there's not much, uh, much materials uh, for people uh, 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 focusing on all validation. Um, uh, I, I know you you focus on quant finance, but thanks a lot for focusing on model validation. That's a huge area. It's going to grow. Uh, I see a huge growth in in in, uh, in next five ten years. Uh, so thank you so much for for organizing this. Sure, thank you, thank you so much, Sheikh. Uh, thank you for joining in today, and thank you for sharing your experience. All right, bye. All right, bye.